All right, everyone, let's, let's pray with me, okay? Lord God, thank you, Father. Thank you for your word. Um, thank you for the desire for your word, and thank you for truth. And, and Lord, just that you love us and you care about us and you care about your name um, and the way of salvation. And, um, just that your word is rightly divided, rightly applied. Your church um, reflects well upon you and um, that we need to be mature and thoughtful and, and prepared, Lord, to test all the spirits, Lord, um, that we encounter um, claiming to be uh, your people and speaking on your behalf. And let's pray this morning you would enlighten your word to us, um, your spirit would minister to us through it. and give us a proper understanding, uh, draw us closer to you, Lord, and uh, an appreciation of your truth. We ask in Christ's good name. Amen. So if you remember, uh, last week Ben taught uh, in 2 Peter chapter 1, um, opened up this book, and um, we're going to hit uh, the second chapter of Second Peter today, but in in chapter one, uh, Peter uh, had reminded the church of the fullness of the salvation that had been granted to them for life and godliness, and uh, had instructed them to avoid being useless or unfruitful. Um, that they must apply all diligence. Um, there was effort on their part, and that would um, be part of making their election certain, uh, which is very important. Uh, and as Ben mentioned, it was making it certain to themselves that they would know that they are truly uh, God's people. And in so doing, they honor, they would be honoring the, the purification that they had experienced from their former sins, um, uh, demonstrating a new life. Um, repented of their former ways and and so um, that's that's what Peter had instructed them uh, as far as their conduct and and he also underscored the trustworthiness of the testimony that uh, he and others had given uh, regarding Christ and that they had conveyed to them and the power that they witnessed and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ um, that they um, took in with their very own eyes and ears. And, and then an even more sure uh, testimony was the prophetic scripture that um, he emphasized. And so, so that, was, that was roughly what uh, Peter was emphasizing in that first chapter. And then when we come to the second chapter, He's going to give a contrast, and um, after you know he he gives his endorsement of the things that that had been imparted to them, he want, he's giving this warning of of these false teachers, and he gives a caricature of what they are like, not exhaustive, but actually tells quite a bit about them, and that they will rise um, in the church. Um, and in contrast to true teachers that God has raised up, and he looks at their doctrine and their demeanor and um, and their motives and things in this chapter. And so, so um, this entire chapter is devoted to that. And so it is a lot of um, a lot of, as I mentioned earlier before we started, kind of scathing comments on these false teachers. And and so it's a it's a pretty harsh set of verses um but rightly so and so so let's look at let's look at the first uh four verses here oh excuse me i knocked my video um and we'll talk about this a little bit and i'll read it it says that false prophets also arose among the people just as referring back to, um, you know, that there, there were true apostles, true teachers. Um, now he's saying, but false prophets also arose among people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce 
destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. And so, and so there is just this reality that there will be a presence of false teachers, um, that they will insinuate themselves into the church um, uh, gathering, the church body, not, not um, in a legitimate sense, but they, they will make their way in amongst God's people. Um, and he notes that, you know, this happened, this has happened all throughout the history of Israel. There were false prophets. Remember when we went through Ezekiel and, and there were many false prophets who told the people what they wanted to hear. Um, they spoke of ease and comfort and peace and there were no bad things coming. Um, and, and the Lord said that they do not speak for him. Right. Um, and, and so they, and that there were, of course, were other other false teachers, um, false prophets, but that was just one example from recent studies that we looked at. And so, so it's not uh, it's to be expected that they're going to continue to exist um, to oppose the truth and to oppose God's witness through the church and through uh, the scriptures. They will be present, um, and Satan. He sponsors these people, and they're they're just he's just relentless. Um, he will not give way um, in trying to draw men away from the way of truth, and from trying to corrupt the pure and biblical way of worshiping God. And so, so that is kind of a reality. Um, and um, back in Deuteronomy thirteen three, it even says that. God does not condone the fact that there are false prophets back then and false teachers today, but he does use it as a way of testing the hearts of his people, which is kind of interesting. And so it's in some ways, it's maybe a way of, of keeping God's people sharp um, and thinking and engaged and aware and paying attention, um, something that he uses. Um, but it is not something that we are supposed to tolerate it really as God's people, right? It's, um, it's not something that we should accept or agree with. Um, and so, so it's um, something that Peter warns them about to expect, to know, to be prepared for when it does happen. Um, it's, and it says that they will secretly introduce heresy they will they won't um introduce false teachings that are are just blatantly and easily um unbiblical um they probably wouldn't get in the door because this is speaking about being within the church so they, they probably wouldn't get that past the church if they just came out right and said you know jesus is not not god they're probably not going to get get in that way they're they're going to um water down truth they're going to mix falsities with truth um they're going to mis misapply truth there's all kinds of things that they would do in a more much more subtle way to make their way in and um i have a few examples of that um if you think about when Christ was tested in the wilderness by Satan in Matthew four, um, a lot of the things that he, the Satan brought up um, to test Jesus um, were biblical. For example, he offered him, if you will submit to me and worship me, I will give you all these kingdoms, right? And it wasn't necessarily a wrong thing for, for Jesus to be given those kingdoms. Um, but it was not the right time, and it was not from the right person. Uh, so it was a misapplication, right? Those sorts of instances, that kind of thing, um, where, where, yeah, they might use scripture, but they use it wrongly. Uh, 
in the, the parallel passage to this in Jude, um, that pastor mentioned, um, this, these have very similar language, these two, this chapter and, and Jude. Um, it says that they turn God's grace into licentiousness or a license. And Jude 4 says, for certain persons have crept in unnoticed. There's that, there's that secretly insinuating themselves amongst God's people. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. And so they do these things. They, they turn God's grace into license for sin or, um, as I mentioned before, they misapply truth. Um, they, they also, their teachings are, are destructive. Um, maybe, they, maybe they don't teach the whole counsel of God. They, um, they teach only the parts that um, are about blessing and comfort and ease and God's love not about repentance or sin or, or sinful behavior. Um, for example, you know, the word of faith or um, prosperity uh, teachers for, may pick a passage like Proverbs 3, 9 through 10. It says, honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your bats will overflow with new wine, which sounds great. It sounds like God intends for us to be wealthy and if we if we give um to the lord which would probably be to these false teachers ministries then we're going to be wealthy we're going to be blessed in return um which is there is some truth in that but the it is a truism it is not an absolute right so that would just be teaching only part of the council on uh, how we handle money and giving um, but to balance it out, you would need to, you know, talk about things like 1 Timothy 6, 9 through 10. It says, but those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sort of evil. And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So that, so that, you know, their initial appeal is really to the greed that, that is part of the natural man and it needs to be countered with something like this passage or there's other passages right that to balance that out so that the giving isn't only so that we are blessed um, it is because we love the Lord and he deserves it and if he decides to bless us or materially or in this life in some way or other um, then we leave that to him and uh, it is not because we live entirely and only for money, that sort of thing. And so those, there's those kinds of things um, as additional ways that, you know, false teachers, I'm sure you're aware of, uh, manipulate scriptures. And these are destructive. Um, uh, sometimes they just out and out pervert scriptures uh, with psychology. Um, I remember uh, when... I was in my early 20s and I was working in a sales position and um, this woman that was my boss was a Christian woman and but she was in a charismatic uh, church and um, her she she quoted the verse love your neighbor as yourself and deduced from that that we are to love ourselves and we are to esteem ourselves and went on about that whole thing um, as a means of having confidence, you know, when you're going into sales and, and that sort of thing. And it was all part of the self-esteem movement that was in the early nineties. Right. And, and um, it was just a misapplication. It was a perversion of really what that scripture is about. The scriptures, we already know how to love ourselves. We love ourselves and think too much of ourselves already. Um, as much as we do that already, uh, we don't need to be encouraged in it. We, we need to be encouraged to love our neighbor and that and that's really more more accurate and so there's those kinds of things um and then just the denying of of the master um it says here uh, who bought you 
Um, they do that. I know Pastor talked about this as can be uh, cited in the limited atonement argument as these people being false teachers, but they were bought by Christ. But I think the bought is kind of a, you claim to be bought, uh, uh, a take on this, but you're, you deny the master in the sense that you, these false teachers don't obey. They don't submit to his authority as master. And you can, you can see where this is used like that in, in, um, Deuteronomy 32, 6, where it's talking about Israel, and it's, um, oh, excuse me, it's uh, used in that sense where the Israelites were bought by God as a nation, but there were people within um, Israel that were not of Israel, so to speak, that sort of thing. They were not really, they had gone through the rituals, but they were not really behaving as people that were devoted to God, it contradicted um, their, their confession. And so, so they, in a sense, they deny his ownership. Um, there's an, at least a, one example of where that happens. And, and so, but these guys, you know, in many ways, these teachers deny the Lordship of Christ. Um, why don't I, why don't I give uh, a minute for anybody who wants to comment on this first section or ask any questions. Yeah, I have a, a question. Any comment on, okay, um, where was it? Sorry. Many will follow their sensuality and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. Any thoughts on why all of their heresies are described in terms of sensuality. Um, why all of their, can you say that again? I'm sorry. I'm yeah, sorry. Why, why, why do you think that the heresies and the um, false, yeah, the destructive heresies are characterized as being sensuality? And if you haven't given any thought to it, don't worry about it. It just came to me and said, I thought that was curious. Um, well, I don't know if all of their heresies are, are characterized as sensuality. I think that's one of their characteristics, either in their either in their personal um, comportment or or in their teachings. You know, it's it's laced in their teachings, sensuality. Okay. okay. Um, it says further down, you know, that their eyes are full of lust and further on in this chapter, that sort of thing, um, which is what they're about. Okay. Dan and uh, Kristen and uh, New King James, it just says that they follow their destructive way. So it's referring back to that first verse again. Oh, so, it is. Okay. Yeah. 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 So there's a, there's a translation issue there. The old King James is pernicious. Mm, okay. I like that. <laughs> Licentiousness, wantonness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they, you know, their their angle, their strategy is to appeal to the strongest drives in the natural man. Okay, that makes right. sense. Yeah, I mean, and, and our sensuality, our sexuality is one of the strongest drives. Money is one of the strongest drives, right? Right. P power, lust, greed, you know, those sort of things. And you know the devil knows that, and these teachers uh, wind up approaching it that way. Good, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Seems to me, uh, seems to me that verse ten kind of unpacks that a little more once we get there in terms of how they, uh, like what those motivations are that they appeal to. Yes. Yeah, they really behave as if. Um, well, they, you know, it says that they're ignorant of, of these things, of uh, the things that they speak of, and it's as if they, it's not as if, but they really don't know the truth of all these things that, that exist, the spiritual realm, and the danger that they're in. Um, they're just shameless and, and um, bold and arrogant um, about what they're doing. 
um, thinking this is really just all a way for them to achieve their goals or line their pockets or gather gain a following or or um, gain power or, um, accolades you know from from people and and uh, they're not really aware of the fact of how much danger they're in and this chapter is very explicit about how much danger they're in <laughs> any other any other comments a quick public service announcement. I muted everybody at the beginning of the meeting, but you all have the power to unmute yourselves at any time. So feel free to unmute yourself. And if you're on the phone without a screen, you dial star six to unmute. All right, thank you, Ben. All right, let's move on a little bit. Um, I was just thinking, you know, as far as, you know, the two main Christian groups, the Protestant and Catholic groups, um, ways in which um, these, these, um, teachings are destructive, um, for things that happen in, on the Protestant side, you know, we find a lot of cheap grace, um, where, you know, you just receive Christ and then go about your life, um, and there's no demand or no expectation for people to repent and to leave off of their sins and turn to God and be obedient to him. Um, it's the, it's this, you know, come as you are and stay as you are. Um, and it just doesn't add up uh, in, in being truly biblical because we've been over this before. But, you know, anybody who's truly born of the spirit has a desire for righteousness and to turn from sin. Um, you know, it says those who thirst for righteousness will be blessed. And so there's a desire um, from being saved from our sins and in a justification manner and in a sanctification manner, there's also a thirst for righteousness um, that um, manifests itself in turning away from sin and not staying as you are. Um, in Titus 1.16, it says, you know, some of these people, they profess to know God, but their deeds, by their deeds, they deny him being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. And so, so again, there's that denying of the authority of Christ over a person's life when they, they profess to accept his salvation, they accept the justification, but do not accept the authority over them in their sanctification. Um, in the Catholic, on the Catholic side, for example, you have, um, you know, the usurping of Christ as the head of the body. Um, and so the authority um, that is despised there is, is um, Christ himself is displaced as the person who is the head of the body. The Pope is the vicar of Christ, right? His visible representative on earth. And, and so you have all kinds of issues with that, um, someone operating in the place of God, so to speak, um, in too much of a literal sense. Um, or in an actual sense, and so, so both both sides have issues, right? We both both sides have issues, um, but the result is that you know the way of truth is is maligned, um, right? Because people that don't repent or and are taught that you know they can use grace um, as a license. Um, and then they just live a, a sinful life. Um, it, it reflects badly on the way of truth because um, there's supposed to be a change, of course, and there's supposed to be a new creation. It's supposed to be Christ-like, and there are many problems also on the on the Catholic side um, with how the way of truth is is maligned. There's false teachings that come from from what the popes um, declare as truth um, above scripture and, and they even contradict themselves and things that they have, have said are, are truths um, ex cathedra. So, so both in, in this way, these false teachers uh, will, they reflect badly on the way of truth. Um, align it or 
their stains on on God, God's name. Um, but let's look. Let's look. Let's move on to verses four through um, through ten because Peter wanted um, his readers to know that he wanted them to be assured that the they will not go unpunished. These false teachers will not go unpunished. And he also wanted to encourage them that, that God has a way of preserving the righteous. Both those things are important. Um, that's the you know, part of the, at least the little bit of positive in here is that God does preserve his people. And so um, can somebody maybe read verses four through 10? You know, Anybody want to mute themselves and read verses 4 through 10? Sure. Thank you. All right. So, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them down and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them is seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord, knowing how to deliver the godly out of Temptations, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Uh, presumptuous are they, self willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Thank you, Taylor. So, so God. There's, he assures them that God has a history of punishing iniquity. Um, maybe not in the time frame that we would like. Um, it's very frustrating um, to see these false teachers continue on often and um, in, in, in our society. Um, and yet God has shown that he does punish. Um, Iniquity, and he's shown it in the past. I'm not going to go into great detail about this, um, but but if you remember, the angels who sinned um, were cast into pits of darkness. And does anybody remember what their sin was? If you look, if you remember from the parallel in Jude six. Oh, I don't think in Genesis. I was thinking of the Genesis one in terms of the cohabitation. Right. And it, that's, Is that in that's a very strong, there's a very strong support for that interpretation. I could see that easily being true. But they left their proper domain, right? That was what they had done. And, um, and then they engaged strange flesh. Um, what about, what about in the flood? What, what was it that was said about um, the population on the earth um, when God decided that he had he regretted making man and that he was going to destroy them? That every thought of their heart was only evil continually. Yes, which is an amazing statement. Um, anything else? Because that that's true. You know, there was it was almost like there was no. There's no turning them back. They were corrupt and filled with violence. Exactly. There was the other thing. The whole earth was filled with violence. Yes. Yeah. So those two things. And and so God, um, he wiped out the, the entire earth except for eight people. Right. Um, so you have God being willing to punish angels in a different realm. God being willing to punish a large number, even the whole, almost the entire population of the earth. Um, there is no too big to fail kind of a principle here. 
um, that sort of thing. He, he destroyed everybody on the earth except for Noah and his family. And then you have this last example uh, where he condemned Sodom and Gomorrah to be reduced to ashes. And um, what, were, what were the sins that they committed? Anybody? Homosexuality. Homosexuality, yes, exactly. Anything else? I didn't well, look up the verse. What was that? Go ahead, Rick. There was violence driven by that. Yeah, yeah, abuse. Yeah. There was also, there was also a gross just overindulgence. Um, I can't remember where the, the um, reference is in the Old Testament, it's more of the prophets, I think, of, um, uh, of just luxurious living, I think, um, materialism. But that was part of it also. It was, and God, uh, he punished them. He destroyed this, the Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities and uh, reduced them to ashes. Um, they are no more. They are gone. So he eliminated a whole people group. Um, and he keeps, uh, he keeps them under punishment, right? Uh, until, until the day of judgment. And what is that day of judgment? Anyone? When will uh, they? Uh, Lord comes again. What is that day of judgment that he's keeping them under, he's keeping them confined until? Ultimately, are we talking the great white throne here? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's when they will ultimately and um, constantly be, be thrown into the lake of fire and punished. Um, you know, the and humans that have sinned and are being held will receive you know the second resurrection they the rec resurrection of their body and and that will accompany them into the lake of fire but for now people are held and angels are held captive not all of them but um there is a greater punishment that is coming um and so so that is what god is doing and he's and peter's assuring his readers that yeah these teachers um think that there's nothing to fear. There's no consequence that God, maybe they don't even believe in God, but the, if there is a God even, that there is nothing to fear. He is not going to do anything. Um, just as, you know, Satan said to Eve in the, in the garden, will God surely, you know, will, will you surely die? Um, is God really going to do anything? Um, and so they have this, this arrogant, um, brazen mentality and the reality is that god is he is going to punish and he's demonstrated that he will punish and the punishment is something to be greatly feared um, on the on the on the other side though god has shown that he has a history of saving the righteous from his wrath and from his judgments um, we see lot mentioned he was saved uh, as if yeah, from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. We mentioned Noah and his family was saved from the flood, um, given the instructions to build the ark. And, and so God does that. And so there is encouragement for um, God's people to dwell on and to count on um, when they witness these things. And uh, God will always have a remnant. God will always have uh, a people that uh, will be a witness for his name. Um, the wickedness of false teachers does not prevail universally, right? Is it an absolute that, that God's people um, are always delivered from judgments? Okay. Yes. Yes. How, how so? I mean, in, 
in an absolute sense, like nothing ever bad happens to them. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> <laughs> no COVID for me. <laughs> right. I mean, I mean, Lot, Lot was delivered. He saved his life. But his whole, I mean, he saved his bodily life. But the whole of his contextual life, his whatever business and his wife um, and all the people he knew, the whole society he was in, all the amenities of that society that he enjoyed, everything, all of that was destroyed, right? No different for, for Daniel. Daniel was preserved, um, even though he's taken into captivity, but he was taken out of his country, taken and lost all of whatever his life was, was composed of in Israel, but he was saved. And so there are, there are losses um, and it's not an absolute that we will not lose um, in this life, but but there is an encouragement that God God does intervene for His people. Any comments on that? Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's frustrating, um, like I said earlier, to see these things, but it's satisfying to know that there is going to be an ultimate justice someday when God has deemed it to happen. I think it's, um, that's an encouragement to me to be forward looking rather than always thinking in terms of here and now, but to keep my eyes fixed on the hope that we have rather than the injustices day by day that we yeah. we your experience yeah yeah exactly it seems like um you know at the same time that it's appropriate as christians to groan you know for the present injustices um and to yearn for that day when when evil will be judged and justice will be done uh, you can look at a lot of the psalms deal with that issue how long you know and even the the saints, uh, the martyrs, you know, in heaven below, beneath the throne are, are asking how long until these, uh, these wrongs are righted and the just are fully delivered. Yeah, and that's a, it's a good sign. It's a good sign of your salvation, right? Because it's mentioned of, of Lot here and he's spoken of as one of the righteous. And, and so if we should be bothered, we should be bothered um, and not callous or numbed to the sinfulness of our um, society or, or even things that are happening in our church you know i often ask myself am i am i just being gracious or am i being numb or indifferent to you know the declension that's that's surrounding us so that's, that's a good point matthew thank you well, let's, let's, um, we've got a few more minutes. Let's start looking a little bit at um, verses 11 through 22. Somebody, somebody willing to read verses 11 through 22? I will. Thank you, Kristen. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffer suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. They can't at pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin, they entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, 
but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. Thank you very much. So, so these false teachers, we see the fruit, right? And this is, you know, Christ said you will know them by their fruit. Bad tree doesn't bear good fruit. A good tree doesn't bear bad fruit. And when he said that, he was speaking of teachers. And so um, we one, one of the ways we analyze a teacher that we follow is, is how they carry themselves in their lives, uh, what they do, how they carry out their ministry, you know, what tone they carry out their ministry, um, uh, how do they work with the leadership, that sort of thing. All, there's various things to look at, but, um, but, the, but their demeanor really reveals the imposters that they truly are. Um, in verse, the end of verse 10, I, I should have included that, but it says, you know, they're daring, they're self-willed, right? And we see that, you know, if you think of this um, in contrast to Peter, right, uh, who was not self-willed. Remember in, the, in this last, in the chapter prior to this, Peter is talking about the end of his life coming and, and you don't see any protest. He's not protesting for his own, benefit. He's, you can see that he is of the posture of the Lord, which was uh, not my will be done, but thy will be done before he went to the cross, right? So he had submitted his will to the Father's will. These aren't, these imposters are not like that. They are self-willed, okay? They, they are not in submission to anyone. They're not interested in submitting to other leaders and say a plurality of elders in the body or submitting um, most importantly um, to scripture. If you remember, um, I just draw your attention back to, to um, chapter one, verse 20, it says, but know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And it's really important that you notice this, that um, Peter, unlike these false prophets, um, he points as a true teacher of God, as a true apostle of God, uh, someone who genuinely fed God's sheep. He points people to the scriptures, right? And it's interesting, I don't know if you noticed this, but um, in verse 19, he makes a really remarkable statement about scripture. Um, mine says, the alternative reading says, and we have the even sure prophetic word. And it's a comparative statement. And it's, it's more sure than something else. And what is it more sure than? What has he just been talking about? If you read the few verses in chapter 1, verses 16, 17, and 18. More sure than his experience. Exactly. So he's, he's saying, Peter's saying here, the prophetic word is even more sure, and you should rely on this, than even what I, I witnessed with my eyes and my ears. Even though that is an important testimony, he submits that to the higher authority of scripture, which is in really direct contrast to these others, right? They're self-willed. They're continually coming up with their own um, authority. They are the authority. What their experience is is the authority. You know, in charismatic circles, they have visions that only they're privy to. They give them authority uh, about truth. And so there's quite a, quite a, distinct contrast. Um, the authority is shifted from Peter. Peter doesn't take that himself. 
exclusively. He gives some credit to his, his witness of what he saw um, was spoken about Christ, but he gives more authority to the scriptures itself. And that is something that, that false teachers do not do. They will not submit to the, to the authority of scripture. The Pope is, has a higher authority right than scripture. False teachers are now in the charismatic circles, claim more authority um, than the scriptures. There are even individuals that are discouraging people in, in charismatic churches to, they're discouraging them from reading the Bible because it would probably contradict what they're teaching. And so it's, it's fascinating the, the contrast here. And so I just thought that was really interesting about Peter uh, and, and these false teachers. And we are at 1045, um, and I didn't get to talk as much about the motives and other things of the destructive nature that these false teachers um, carry out. But, but does anybody want to mention anything or have a comment or question here? Yeah, I have Go ahead, Rick. Go ahead. Okay. Do you have any thoughts on um, verses 18 and 19, the, what the word they refers to? You know, they, they in verse 18 obviously speak of false teachers, but is 19, do you think 19 refers to the false teachers again or to those, to their victims, essentially, who are duped by them? Well, they themselves, I think, are slaves of corruption refers to the teachers, I think, right? Yes, I agree there. The question then is, what does 19 and following refer to? Promising them freedom. Not, a, not an easy thing in, in my estimation. So you've got pronouns, what they promised them, and then... Well, I think, I think then you return, in 20, you return to um, the people that they've duped. Yeah, that's the question, is, is there a transition there? And yeah. are they... Yeah, so. yeah. So thanks for your insights on that. No problem. I'm trying to... uh, this is Martha, and I just wanted to have the thought that I had at the beginning um, about the sensuality. And I think that these days there's a sensuality satisfying all of our senses, our intelligence, our sense of beauty, uh, all sorts of things like that that are just not sexual sensuality, but other sensuality that we have concerning our uh, surroundings and everything. We're exalting all those things over scripture. Thank you very much. That's a really good point. Um, it's not only sexuality. There's, it just appeals, there's a lot of appeal to all of, all of the lower things instead of our minds. Um, you know, these guys are presented as, you know, irrational, unreasoning animals. They're, they're driven by instinct, by impulses, uh, cravings, those sort of things. Um, and they don't, they're not driven by principle or the uh, reasoning upon the scriptures. Um, and so they do appeal to, to greed and to luxury and, and different things that are strong drives in us. Um, and that that work they're effective they get people to follow them for those reasons um, for and so so you're right I was thinking also that there's a, a great pride taken in our intelligence ex exalting our own intelligence above the word that's true yeah it, it's a uh, and that, that's a very dangerous place we are in history where, where um, humans um, sit in judgment of the scriptures instead of letting the scriptures judge them, right? Uh, they decide what, is, what parts of the scriptures are true, what parts of the scriptures they want to um, accept, um, to make up their God, um, instead of allowing God to define himself through the scriptures and, and also... Uh, define his ways in the scriptures.
Any other closing comments, questions? Sorry, I didn't get to more. Okay, let's pray and go to our groups. Father God, thank you. Thank you for um, defining, Lord, what um, false teaching looks like and making us aware. Lord, help us to stay in your word regularly and um, to search it out and be familiar and to understand it, Lord, that we wouldn't be led astray, um, to trust in it and um, submit to its rightful authority, um, not to other human beings or um, teachings, Lord, that contradict it. And we just, uh, we thank you, Lord, um, for your, your judgment, for uh, your promise um, that justice will be served um, when you see fit. Um, help us, Lord, to accept um, the things that are very vexing around us. Um, in your time, but not be indifferent to them, Lord. Um, help us to be lights and to be a contrast to those things um, and to have boldness, Lord, and when we encounter false teachings. Um, for your namesake, for your glory, and for your church, we ask these things in Christ's good name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for uh, teaching you, the word today, Dan. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Excellent. Yes, thank you. Oh, good job.